And I gave him the following advice. I said, look, book another test, your fourth attempt, for a Saturday, eight weeks forward. I want you to go to the test center every Saturday for eight Saturdays in a row at the same time as you will in the actual test. Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by quantreasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at quantreasoning.com. student that I worked with almost 10 years ago now, who, if I recall, took the test four times and started fairly low. He started in the mid 500s on his first actual GMAT. And he really only wanted to go to Harvard Business School. He said, if I don't get in there, I'm not going to business school. That was his goal. So with a 550, obviously there was no point in, uh, in applying. So he took it again and again. And after his third attempt at which he got I want to say maybe 660, he called me and he said, Avi, the strangest thing happened to me uh, when I got to the test center today. I uh, left the house and got onto the subway to get to the test center, just as I always do. Once I got onto the train, I turned off my phone because I knew I was going to the test center and you have to turn off your phone. So I turned it off. But then I remembered that I had planned to listen to this special playlist that would get me into the right mindset just as Vivek was asking. So, you know, so I had this playlist that I wanted to listen to. So I turned the phone back on to listen to the playlist. Then I got to the test center and the lady who works there asked me to turn off my phone because I was going in to take the test. And, uh, and I was like, oh yes, of course, I need to turn it off. And I look at my phone and for the life of me, I can't recall how to turn off this phone. So I stop him right there in this, uh, as he's telling me the story, I stop him and I say, hang on a second, didn't you just turn it off 20 minutes earlier on the train? He's like, yes, exactly. So 20 minutes earlier, I turned it off, no problem. Now I'm standing at the test center. I'm, I was reminded to turn off my phone. And for the life of me, I cannot recall how to turn it off. I stood there like an idiot for two minutes. And in the end, she had to help me figure out how to turn off my phone. I couldn't recall how to do it. So I'm listening to the story and I'm thinking, if he can't recall how to turn off his phone, even though he had just done it 20 minutes earlier, how is he going to recall the Pythagorean triples? You know, 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, etc. How will he recall that pi r squared is the area of a circle? How is he going to recall anything? That's when it dawned on me that there was a significant gap between his ability level and the actual score that he's been getting on the tests. I should clarify, I knew there was a gap because I had been working with them, but I didn't know the reason for the gap until that moment. That's when I realized, okay, now I understand why this student isn't achieving his potential at the test center. Something happens to him, something happens to his brain the minute he walks in there. His hands are a bit shaky and his brain is foggy and he can't recall things that normally would be very easy for him to recall. And I gave him the following advice. I said, look, book another test, your fourth attempt, for a Saturday, eight weeks forward. I want you to go to the test center every Saturday for eight Saturdays in a row at the same time as you will in the actual test. I want you to bring with you your ID and your water and your snack and whatever things you bring for the actual test. I want to bring them with you every time. I want you to have the same breakfast at home before you leave every Saturday. I want you to have the same dinner every Friday night the night before. I want you to go to sleep at the same time. I want you to wake up at the same time. And I want you to have the same exact amount of coffee. Every Saturday you wake up and you pretend that this is the day. And you go to the test center. You walk all the way in. You say hi to the lady who works there. You're like, yep, it's just me again. Just, uh, just coming to say hi. No, not taking the test today. See you again next week. Bye. And you leave. And he did that. And when finally his fourth attempt came up, he reported back to me later and said, you know what, Avi, it felt like just any other Saturday. Like for the first time ever, going to the test center didn't feel like a big deal. It didn't feel like this big, important day that I've been working towards for two years and, uh, and you know, doing all this studying and it's all going to come down to this one event. It didn't feel that way 
that time because it just felt like any other Saturday. It was his routine. And he got a 7.10 that day and, uh, and got into Harvard uh, with that 7.10. Uh, and by the way, I think part of why Harvard took him in with a 7.10, which is on the lower end f for Harvard, is because they saw all four attempts. Because a decade ago, you couldn't cancel your score once you saw what it was. So, so he didn't cancel any of them. They saw, wow, he's, here's a guy who's willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. He's been at it for two years. He took it four times. He went from 550 to 610 to 660 to 710. That's the kind of student we want to see at Harvard, Harvard Business School. And I've talked to a lot of professional admissions consulting people and asked them specifically about that. And they all agreed that, yeah, they, they, they can't say for sure he would not have gotten in had he canceled the first three, but they can say for sure that it helped. Put yourself in the shoes of an, of an admissions officer at Harvard, right? Here comes a student who uh, took the GMAT only once, right? Because if he canceled the first three, then as far as you know, he only took it once. So he took it only once, got a 710, which is below the average for Harvard Business School, and decided to apply with that. Didn't even bother trying a second time. That tells a very different kind of story about the, the character of, of this candidate, right? We don't want that kind of, uh, you know, uh, a bit like a quitter, right? It took it one time, got a 710, and that's it, didn't want to try again, what a quitter. Versus, wow, being at it for two years, showed continuous improvement every time. Uh, the only reason, I think, to cancel a score is if you already had a higher score. Like, if your score went down, I don't see any advantage to keeping the lower, the newer lower score. I, I see no advantage to that. But, uh, and maybe even if it stayed the same, I would cancel. But anytime it goes up, well, keep the first one, first of all, and then continue to keep scores as long as they're going up. Only cancel if they stay the same or go down. Sometimes uh, a score will go down, but one of the subscores went up, right? Maybe you had a quant uh, 40 and verbal 40, and then the next attempt you got a quant 48, but your verbal went down to 30, let's say. So maybe your overall score went down 10 or 20 points, but your second test with a lower score had a quant of 48 versus a quant of 40. It absolutely will, will benefit you to keep the newer score because the school now has no reason to worry about your quantitative reasoning ability because they see now that you got a 48. So in general, I think people cancel scores a lot more than they should. You should only cancel a score in special circumstances. There are a few things that I think are important. Number one, don't broadcast to the world that you're going to be taking the test that day. Because if you broadcast it to the world, then now you're thinking, oh, shit, what if I don't do well? Everybody will be texting me tonight to ask how the test went. You don't want that kind of pressure at the test center. Try to do whatever it takes so that the actual test day doesn't feel like a big deal. You don't want it to feel like a big deal. You want, to you want it to feel like any other day as much as possible. And breathing. Especially if, uh, say, the test starts and you feel yourself panicking a little bit, you'll be much better off putting down the pen, uh, closing your eyes, leaning back in the chair, even while the timer is ticking, and just taking three deep breaths. Like That will actually lead to a higher score than if you try to push through the panic and, and try to solve questions when you're in fight or flight mode. So, so I think those are all the, the big tips that I would give for, for mindset. And I think the playlist is a good idea. If you always listen to the same playlist when you're uh, right before you do a practice test, then uh, you, know, you can have the same playlist before the actual test. And I think you made a good point there, which is it's, it's very easy when you're, say, on question number 12 to accidentally find yourself thinking about question number 11. Like all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, I wonder if I got the previous question right or wrong or, you know, should I have done it differently or did I spend too long on it or did I go too quickly? There are a lot of questions that can pop into your mind about the previous question and you don't want that, right? You, you want to just have question number 12 in front of you, not question 11 and not question 13. That happens as well, right? You're on question number 12 and you're thinking, hmm, what if the next question is reading comprehension? I hate reading comprehension. What if it's a long passage versus a short passage? All these kinds of questions can pop up in your, in your mind, right? Or, or even, 
hey, I wonder if right now am I looking at a hard question or at an easy question? Because if I'm looking at a hard question, that implies that I got the previous one right. But if I'm looking at an easy question, that implies I got the previous one wrong. So what do I think? Is it hard or easy? All these irrelevant thoughts that, that, are, that can be distracting in the middle of the test. So to your point, Vivek, it's really important to focus on only what's in front of you in the moment. Uh, there's a quote from Kung Fu Panda, you know, the animated movie, where Master Ugwe says, The past is history, the future is a mystery, and the present is a gift. That's why it's called the present. All the questions that came up before the one that's in front of you are history. They're, they're irrelevant. And all of the ones that haven't come up yet, you know what? Even the GMAT doesn't know what the following questions will be. So it's a, it's a mystery not just for you, it's even a mystery for the GMAT, because it's an adaptive test. The GMAT doesn't know what your next questions will be. It's going to depend on what you do in this one. You really want to try to focus just on the one in front of you, and if that's a struggle, I know for a lot of people that's really hard to, to really focus on the, the one thing that's on the screen in front of them to the exclusion of everything else. If that is hard for you, then uh, you want to start practicing mindfulness also known as meditation, like today. Like, st start, start right now. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.